What up, what up, what up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode number 40 of No Labels Necessary. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music. Y'all know the plan. And of course, what are we chopping up about music, money, content creating, economy as a whole, and, you know, just having a little fun all together. So speaking of fun, <laughs> oh, if you want to use that word, <sighs> let's. Let's go to the sage of advice when it comes to the importance of having a team as an artist. If you miss this point, then you're missing out on life. Let's listen to this quote. And run other than shakori has got a little boost. My God. It's a group effort, man. It, it, it's a team, man. If you don't have a team, your hustle is isolated, man. It, it's only what you can bring to the table. Most deals that, them, that come about, other people can go get those deals. You don't have to be the only one to go get those deals, man. You 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 gotta have you gotta you gotta have you gotta have a team with people who can put on a suit and go talk to people. You know, everybody can't put on a suit and go talk to people and make them believe. You gotta have those guys. You gotta have those guys to protect you from all this this this, this rap this rap this madness in the street. It's just, it's, that's just reality. If you don't if you think you can do it by yourself. You just can't, bro. You, 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 you'll fall. Wise words. Wise words, man. They might not always be wise, but those are, those are clearly wise. In my opinion. You know, what I like about this so much is the way that he talked about it, right? We can talk about one topic a million times over, but if it's introduced in different perspectives with a different point made, I still find a lot of value in it. And I don't hear people say it from that angle a lot where, course we know you want more people on your team because you can only do but so much work in terms of the time that you have right cool we get that but just the ability to say no some people just can't do some things and others can i might not be able to put on a suit and convince these folks right because i might not speak the language of the boardroom or i might not have a look you know, call it discrimination or whatever you will, but I might not have a look that's as convincing. They might think, hey, man, this this rapper guy don't really know what he talk about. He's stupid and I don't really trust him. But then you can have somebody be a representative that talks in that language, looks the part, and they're able to convince him. Mm -hmm. Everybody believes that guy. Everybody yeah. believes that guy. And that's also the value in a lot of times of a manager, right? Because people see conversations with managers different. It's hard to completely explain but you know artists get a stigma of being maybe over sensitive or they just know that you are the one who's being impacted because you look you are the product in many ways right so let's just say it's before a show and there's some bad news to deliver better to deliver it to the manager than the artist because the artist still has to go before him right after that right so i give it to the manager the manager ha handles everything and now the artist isn't distracted from doing whatever they need to do right so there's a lot of angles um, and reasons why it's best to have team members. But that idea literally, hey, some people can, can do this. And some people can't do that. I can't, I can't do everything is not from a legitimate, legitimate capacity standpoint, but from a straight up, hey man, like different strokes from different folks. Some people got talents and, and some people just have a different energy that speaks to other people in a, in a different way and mm -hmm. makes certain things happen. Like that's a, a true part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that to me was my favorite part was that he didn't touch on it from the typical music industry positions, right? Like you need a manager, you need this, because I think, I think on one side of it, artists are used to hearing that, right? You need the business side of it. Yeah. And then two, there's always going to be an artist out there who is an anomaly where it's like, hey, I didn't need a manager to make it. Or I didn't need a I didn't need these different business entities. But we, he's just could, like you said, basically saying is like, hey, that golden team member for you may not be a specific position that you're used to hearing about. It may just be someone who can, who fits the mold of your business that you can't do for whatever reason, even if you are doing it, right? And I've seen that come and go in many ways, you know, from the artists that we're doing their own cover arts and you know they were cool when they were doing it but they got a graphic designer and and they're better right it's like you know yep. you could do it but this person could do it better than you and if they could speak their language and do things that you couldn't so yeah i think that's important and then um you know it's it's one of those things where i think that it's hard to explain to artists until they get into the fold and start realizing like what exact team members do you need 
Exactly. You know, because I even tied it to security. You need someone to protect you from, well, I'm, I'm, we're just going to say you're talking about security, right? Tied it to security, right? You need yeah. someone that, even something as simple as just having someone to protect you from the lifestyle that you're building for yourself. Yeah. He is a team member that most artists probably wouldn't even think about until they get to the point to where their success has created a problem for them, right? And then you realize, like, you know, the first time you have 30 kids bum rush you out after the show, that's when you're like, oh, shit, maybe I do need security. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, them little motherfuckers got back here too quick. You know, <laughs> like there was no real resistance between them and back here where I was at. Maybe I should think about getting secure that. Now I see that that's that guy or girl is important for my operation. So, right. you know, some of it is just growing pains. I think like that, like, so I would tell artists, like a lot of times building your team is just you experiencing your growing pains and then thinking really critically about who to find to solve this problem. Okay. Damn, I keep having this issue. I try to fix it five different ways. Two of them were terrible. Three, I just didn't enjoy doing. I need a person for this. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is, I need to find somebody to fill this role for me. Right. Right. And the, the caption on this one was without a team, your hustle is isolated, mm-hmm. which is something that I feel like a lot of indie artists don't realize they create. And there's levels to it. There's the indie artists trying to DIY, do everything literally themselves. And then you have some that have some friends. They get a few more people on their team, but there's still this ego that's keeping them from being in legitimate partnerships or letting go of some things. They have to do everything themselves and figure out everything, not because it's necessarily the best long run for any legitimate reason, but sometimes you're just that ego of, I have to do it myself. And that's one thing that the indie side is is breeding in a, a negative way. It's just something to be aware of because part of that blood, that energy is what allows you to accomplish things as an indie, right? But then there's a, becomes a level of it where you have to realize, ah, this is ego, right? Because I don't even want to maximize in this area, right? I want to, I don't know, let's just say, La Russell did like a pay to, what is it? Pay, pay what you want. Pay what you want restaurant experience, right? Yeah. Imagine if La Russell was like, well, shoot, I'm going to have to create a restaurant, build a legitimate restaurant, you know what I mean? and run a restaurant just so I can do this experience versus, hey, there's a restaurant that already exists, and then I partner with them to create an experience, right? It's a different type of thing because it doesn't make any sense, but maybe going round up and owning everything makes more sense. If you truly say, hey, I'm trying to build an investment and have my own restaurant brand and you're building something long-term, that's different. So you have to pick and choose when you do I lean in and take control of more or do you partner? If I just trying to run up the money, a lot of times it doesn't make sense to like own everything and do everything from ground zero, right? Because I'm just trying to maximize, get as much money, visibility, maybe flip the visibility and all that, but I don't need to own this thing because I'm only doing it for this isolated experience. Yeah. So like that's something that comes to mind when you think about teams and how you go away, uh, go about partnership. Well, let me take a quick second to say if you're an artist trying to blow your music up or if you're a manager, a music professional in general trying to help an artist blow their music up, I have something that's a game changer for you and it's completely free. As you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply. It's completely free. But the thing is, We're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. But speaking of teams, Rick Ross has standards if you want to be on his team. Yeah, for sure. There's a certain way you got to move. And I love this clip. And I want to go ahead and break it down. Well, listen to him break it down. We can chalk it up about it. Let's go. Look everybody in the eyes. Do you really want this? Oh. Cause I hope you understand once I become a part of this, every day we get on all platforms and rep our brands. Not once a week. That's offensive to me. Every day. You ain't thinking about winning every day. It's just like laying your outfit out. What we get money with, who we get money with. 
we going to make them feel us every day. If you're a business partner of mine, when you sit down before you go to bed, I want your chick that's in the bed with you to say, y'all, you seen what Rose did today. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A full that's how I hustle. Wow. That's how I really get down. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like if you're a real partner, that's what you should be bringing to the table. And if you're not, it's somebody like me that's on the team and I'm more valuable than you are. And I'm more valuable than you are. Man, you're right. Every team you need that person, bro. Every team needs that 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 that, that power A player. You know what I'm saying? And um, I got I got with I, I I do not think that every person is that. You know, so I, I would make that slight argument. But the sentiment is the same, right? Like, are we not waking up every day, um, attempting to get others to believe in our brand, or at least make them think we believe in it as much as we think we want them to believe that? You know what I'm saying? I I agree with that that part of it. I think that brings a question, what you just said. So it's a two sides to this. So you hear a lot of business people say, hey, you can't expect other people to have the same level of intensity as the business person, mm -hmm. right? Like Gary Vee would be like, all my employees shouldn't be necessarily as about it as I am because I own the business. And it's part of my job as a business owner to make sure that things move forward. They're not as invested. Mm -hmm. completely understandable but there's also the a player argument that you talked about where a players attract a players they demand to have a players and i think especially early on as much as possible you want to get as many a players as possible or make sure that there's a clear standard that you're pushing people towards so you gotta demand people on your team to be at a certain level and perform on a certain way because mm -hmm. i don't but when, this is a big thing he actually said. I think what he says is 100% true because you know what he did? He said if you're a partner, a business partner. Like if you were a team member instead of an owner, I probably shouldn't expect the same type of energy as if you were an owner. However, if you are a co-owner in this, then I shouldn't be getting team member energy yeah. because you have expectations of owner payout. Yeah. All right. That just doesn't make any sense. So I get what he says and I like the way he positioned it because it's not just like, it's not just about, hey, is this a good opportunity for me? And I think you probably get more and more uh, selective with this when you get more and more money and you have more choices and you're not just trying to make shit shake because the way he pr approached it was like, yo, like, are you really about this? Because when I get involved, I'm really about this. Shit gonna turn up or not? Shit gonna turn up. I know how I rock. How you rock, bro? Because there's a lot of situations where it's like, hey, man, we can just stay cool and not get into business together because we're not talking about like, oh, no shady shit being done. We're just talking about like, if you ain't putting that same type of energy, I'm gonna look at you different. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna need you to put that energy in there. And I think early on, people should look for that as much as possible however we do know realistically as an artist you might just be trying to get whatever you can get manager you might be able to try, man, might be trying to get whatever you can get for the time being but you should always be trying to look for who has that energy who takes shit seriously who performs on a certain level because that's just how they rock all right and how can i elevate them even if it's not a partner it's just a team member that's working for me, how can I elevate them? Because they have a high standard for themselves and that gives me assurance that I can trust in them. And now I need to just put some more people who got high standards, build a team around that, and we know that we can take things to another level. So it's a balance that is harder to achieve sometimes in the beginning, but to me, you should always be looking for that because the people who, who have that energy they exist and there's plenty of them who aren't owners, right? They might not want to be the entrepreneur or whatever, or they're just in a phase in their life where they rather work for somebody or whatever. They're there. You just have to find them. And they can be expensive though, as as things, you know, because a lot of times if they got that type of energy, they probably done set a price, you know, um at the in the marketplace. Yeah, for good reason. For good reason. For good Based reason. off of their achievement, not not the people who, oh, I just want to get paid more because I want to get paid more. Or I feel like I'm doing more because doing more isn't the same thing as achieving more. Yeah. And when you get into the sphere as someone who can achieve more, I can make sure this shit goes viral. I can make sure this shit gets done with a level of trust and consistency. I can bring in a team up under me 
and make these things go to another level. Now, like your price goes way up. Like I remember hearing Alex Ramosi talk about like the difference between a hundred fifty thousand dollar a year employee and a two hundred fifty thousand dollar employee is such a massive gap. It's ridiculous, and it's so funny because I heard another person say that as well. Like when I had hired my um, first like two hundred fifty thousand dollar employees, like man, I could like kind of like forget about things, so, like just like let them rock, and then I think. At least Alex might have talked about like the million dollar employee that, that, that they've had to play or whatever. But it's just a difference. It's like it's one thing to be like, I got to train you, hold your hand, do everything. It's another thing to be like, oh, I train you, but then you get it quickly and then you start to, uh, you know, knock it out with need management. It's another thing. I give you a little training insight, you get it. And then all of a sudden you start to improve yourself and the process. It's another thing to be like, you come in with hella experience. And can kill it off rip, bring me new information, and you start to continue to grow, right? It's a whole it's a whole other thing that you can do all that shit and grow my business, not just yourself, <laughs> yeah. without me and train everybody else. Like those are levels, 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 levels. And it takes skill sets and more, you know, um and experience to get to that point. But like these team members, man, you I think at the end of the day, just to keep it simple, is what's the standard that somebody has for themselves, right? What's the urgency that someone has to achieve, not even a specific task, but like, yo, I want to do something greater. Because that's personally how I am. Like, I'm always on some, I just want to do something like, yes, I want to make a lot of money and I want to do something that's dope, all right? Like, and that's always going to drive me regardless. It's like, I just don't like the idea of, going through a whole life and only doing small shit. Like, this is not something that attracts me. So, you're always, and I find, over time, I find more and more people where, hey, they want to do some dope shit. You know, you attract that energy that you put out, right? They don't want to just do small shit. They, and yes, they. some people actually don't care about the money at all. They just want to do something really big. I'm not that person. I do care about the <laughs> money as well. And then, and so, and that's a whole other balance. We got the people who just want to make money. You got the people who just want to do some cool shit. Then you got the people who, are, who want to do both. All right. I'm definitely on the most side of that. <laughs> but the point is, like, at least if you, no matter what you want, if you have a standard for yourself and like, yo, bro, let's do whatever we doing. We decide to do, we do this shit on the best level, the highest level. Everything else start figuring itself out. Cause most teams aren't like that. I saw um, Aaron, the music entrepreneur club podcast. I mean, say, you know, her. I think I saw her say something like that. It's not a lot of people in the music industry that work hard. Mm. And I remember when I came in the music industry, I was like, these niggas don't work. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I felt. And I still like am kind of find a balance. Like now I feel like I don't work hard enough based on how I usually would work. But then you get into music and then see the pace is so different. And it's hard to like, it's like, damn, I'm 10 steps ahead. And I'm waiting for people to move so I can move because the clients I ain't even ready yet. It's all these other elements, but it's, it's, it's a true thing. So if you ain't working hard, yo, especially if you got a team with you working hard, is going to differentiate you from everybody else. Like small things, just like when we had the agency, us just not being scammers differentiated us. <laughs> just, yeah. just treating people right. Right. Yeah. Right. And actually doing the work. Yeah. Right. That simple thing. A lot of people speak that like grind culture and shit like that and music but most niggas really aren't working that hard bro and obviously everybody but for the most part who listens to us being in the music space y'all take that and understand that's like a real thing it's gonna take you a lot farther because you don't you're not gonna see it at first but it's gonna separate you from the pack yeah like you said it'll attract the right people and you know you don't need a lot of those people for things to move by one or two of you to get the get the ball moving in the right direction you know, I, I think to touch on something you said earlier, too, just for, I guess, you know, those who are looking for more of employees and then um, partners, per se, like, I mean, I think those are the type of employees you want to, right? The ones where, hey, like, yeah, this isn't your business. And you're right, like, I've given you the leeway to move like an employee, but you move like this is your shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, you take care right. of it. You act on certain things. You learn to grow because, like, you feel just as much ownership in this as, as I might, you know what I'm saying, with it being my thing. Like, those people, 
are invaluable too. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't meet a lot of employees who think that way. Like most employees are just like, okay, I'm Sean to me, I got done the clock at 10. You told my day over with a seven, seven oh one, I'm off this bit. Six fifty nine, fifty nine, my hand over the log up button versus that be the extra employee that might hit you at night. Like, yo, you know, no, it's out the seven, but woo de woo, bam, 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 bam. And you looking at your shit like, oh damn, like they still working on this shit. You know, that's fine. You know what I'm saying? Because they, they, they didn't have to. So those people are are also valuable. And I think sometimes we'll, you know, as business owners, you'll run across those people. And because some of your other team members may be that way, you forget like how rare those people are. You know what I'm saying? Until you were presented someone that's not like that, and then you remember again, like, oh shit, like, I, you hired number five, the other four were like this, and you were like this, yeah, everybody's not like this. Everybody's not, literally, everyone's not built like you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get rid of, yeah. And the, that's, that's my thing, man. It's, I feel like a lot of people don't have a reference point because they're not around other people that are like giving that energy. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for them to really, like feel and understand the difference. And I remember we talked about, uh, we were talking to a homeboy in LA last time. I think it was the last time both me and you were there. And he was like, he left his job to go work with Diddy and them. Oh, okay. Cause he just wanted to feel like what it was like to run with the dogs basically. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like see, make, prove to himself that he can make it work. Cause he knows that if anything, whatever you say about Diddy, Diddy hustle, he go hard. To be in that environment, be in that vicinity, and not get burnt by the sun says something about you and whatever, whatever, or whatever you're able to maintain. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard to today, especially in a, like, like our shit, we have so much remote going on, right? It's hard to, like, really see how much work is going on between different individuals, how much, like, impact, um, like, and, and really, like, bleed off on, on people like you would in that environment. If you're working together, like if you're around it and you're a personal assistant or something like that, that clearly rubs off on you because just like anything else, the people you spend time with, the people you become, mm -hmm. right? But there's even in today, if you build your team where your producers in a different city and I know artists whose managers are in different cities, multiple like that, like I'm talking about across the actual country from each other, there's still ways that you like can stay in contact and and at least get a sense, but I don't think you can a hundred percent even replace that. Well, now that I think about it, the more and more I experience remote, and then we we just talked about this like dipping back being around some in person environments, you just just can't replicate it. Yeah, no, that's too much uh, freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remote work, you know. And I say that as a person that's been doing remote work, well, I love it. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes I even have to look at myself and like, no, man, if you was in the office, you're gonna be. Doing it like this, you know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta figure that shit out. Yeah, got that shit done with and being on to the next thing. Yeah, exactly, bro. Right. I'm trying to get out of this bitch. It's funny, it's funny how the brain works, bro. You in office, you work faster. You get out of that bitch faster. And you out of office, you work slower because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to get fans too fast and get thrown mobile work. Remember, it's crazy to think about that, bro. Like, that's what remote work is done. You used to work faster, you know what I'm saying, be, get this shit over with. So you hopefully had nothing else to do. Now you like, nah, these niggas might have at least another eight things in the queue. Let me drag this shit out. <laughs> you know, I saw a great point about a company. They were saying that they want to start hiring remote, but they haven't figured out a way to like really train and maintain their quality control. Mm -hmm. And they trust their culture so much. They they value their culture so much. And what they were saying is, yeah, there's all these people that are like, oh man, these people start to work at home and they're more productive. But when you look at it, it's like, well, especially when the pandemic happened, it's like most of those people still got trained in office, mm -hmm. right? And then that culture was executed at home. So they're like, yeah, well, they're going to have remote workers. But right now they haven't seen a substitute for training for the culture that's in their office. So they're going to start bringing people over to where they are, train them in office for maybe like, I don't know, 90 days or something like that. And then they can go back and live their remote life. Because now they got that culture in them. Because that's how hard it is when you have a remote situation. You know, if you were to really see what the daily hustle is like and grind, you could you, you see each other every once in a while. Things probably aren't even as serious in that moment. You know, it's like you working, but it's not. It's more casual than the everyday. Like, what is this shit taking? What goes into it? So, I thought that was a really good point because, like, yeah, we haven't seen like a, a whole slew of companies hire people that were only remote 
and never have been in office and culture and then say, yeah, our stats look better. There's some co companies that are in niches like internet companies, like uh, make money online and things like that. A lot of people in our space build um, remote teams and label, you know, any labels that are like, they were surprised that to see Barry and them, like that they were in different spaces. I just assumed all of them were in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that's interesting. You definitely know it works, but I think that Again, it's such a rare situation, especially when you want to hit a certain scale. And it, it's, it's very unique to to be able to achieve and, and do that. And you have to have the right makeup for it. But, you know, remote aside, because I know some of y'all might be like, man, well, I don't know what does that have to do with artists or specifically, <laughs> but all of this shit is business ownership. And it's stuff for, for y'all to think about. And I feel like I saw somebody in the comments um, an episode or two ago was like, oh yeah, y'all's perspective is more biased right. towards managers and shit like that. Yeah, he's right. So I was like, I was like, yeah, we are right. because we business, we professional, we work on the back end, we're not artists, right? I mean, but I'm. My thing is, it's here because when you deal with the business stuff, that's how you're gonna have to think. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna think about the artist stuff like a uh, an artist. I mean, the, the business stuff like an artist. You might have your artist empathy. But if you want to execute it and do it on a real level, you have to think about it from a business person's perspective. It's like being a parent, right? It's like you're a child and you're like, ah, I don't really rock with this, that, and the third. Then you become a parent and then you see it completely different. You understand, oh, well, that's why they did that. Or you just become the boss of the manager and you start understanding mm -hmm. certain things. You're like, oh, this is why Brub said, make sure I log in every day and clock in because now I can't track shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like this, yeah. this is why I need X, Y, and Z. And now you have to feel the brunt of it. So we talk about these subjects from the perspective, not to try to fake and do some, hey, we're, we're the artists and want to like pretend like we're the artists, giving the artist perspective. It's like, no, this is just as valuable for the artist to graduate and control their indie business and structure. We're going to bring on and talk to some artists to have all that artist shit and like in terms of like that perspective, but like, I don't, at least that's where I, I feel like we sit. I don't see a lot of people that speak enough on the business side that isn't just a straight preachy. You need to own your shit. You know, like those same like three, four subjects. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's just, and then and, and they coming at you, you know, with the like, oh, wait, like yelling at you type vibe. Which is cool, like like Gary V type energy, right? Yeah. Too same thing, and that's cool too. And I can be inspired. I like I actually like brash delivery. Some people know, but I actually personally, um, am, am cool with that. But there's this other perspective where if you don't hear the thoughts behind the thoughts, you really don't understand the shit. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's so fun about talking with like other executives and even artists, uh, photographers, like just all these other people in the game and having a casual conversation that's not about business because that's when you get the conversations and the thoughts behind the thoughts. Like how we even talk right here is like we don't plan every single word because we're like having those thoughts in real time, but that creates the thought that you execute a campaign with. I took all this shit into account and then I made my decision. It wasn't just like, oh, here's a science book and people be looking for like science book answers from us. Sometimes like, hey, do one, two, three step and then we could do a video like that. But then you do that, but you don't understand when that does apply and doesn't because you actually don't understand the shit. You were just trying to copy our work, right? Mm -hmm. Or follow the, the recipe and the recipe ain't good for all occasions, all right? Versus damn, Corey just said this, but he said he got it from this. So the reason he thought about it was really an analogy that he drew together. And then he came to this conclusion. So if you understand where it came from, now you might understand when it does work, when it don't work, or you can add it to your perspective. And that's my, my uh, favorite way to think of it. I just go around collecting frameworks. You say some shit, from a different perspective of how I think about it. I'm like, oh, now I got that way. And I'm still looking at it as my way and your way. And then I might get to other new ways 
But now I just got like five different ways of looking at the same thing. I don't replace. I feel like niggas be trying to replace and find the one. And this shit don't really work like that. It ain't no one. And not in this shit. It's not. <laughs> right? So you just gain, collect perspectives. And then when you add all five or all 10 or all 20 ways to look at that same shit, that's actually going to create this like new perspective. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That doesn't that that creates something special and that's when people start doing that special shit you got someone like Kanye who went to, to you know um like he was an artist right art school got accepted into art school and he's also a producer and he's also a rapper and he interned for louis back in the day early on and then all this shit you see in today wasn't just like oh i'm a uh a, a music person who wanted to start doing some merch right and running like music people doing the merch no i'm a music person and i interned for louis and now, 10 years later, y'all are seeing me come with different lessons and perspectives that I got from other people, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's just collecting perspectives. And especially as an artist, that's really the shit that you should value because that, we, we talk about how your POV is unique. Your POV is only as unique as the perspectives and experiences that you've collected. Yeah, it's facts. It's facts. So there is some shit on here for, for y'all artists that got who said, who said that? Yeah, man, it can't wait for Louis, man. If we, if we weren't doing it, you'd be like, I wish there was somebody out there giving hey. the, the business perspective from the business guy. So, I, <laughs> so when I started coming out, I was like, bro, like, yeah. yeah. Bro, I mean, I was just going to like it and keep moving. <laughs> I think I did like it, actually. Nah, that's like, I did see it like it. In yeah. mind, I said that was probably Jacory. Yeah, it was me. Because I, I, <laughs> I was like, you probably wouldn't do that. But, <laughs> and, and for y'all who are listening, because I know there's a lot of valuable people um, and, and listeners who, who don't think that way at all and see value in the podcast. This is, look, we don't need y'all this shirt except from a standpoint of like, hey, man, you know, don't listen to the hater. This ain't us getting wrapped up by the hater because I know some of y'all will, will say something like that. It's, um, what I see it as like a teachable mm-hmm. moment. When I see people that come with that type of perspective, we can argue and be like, oh, bro, you just don't get that shit and you, you stupid and da da da, or, or ours is better. I'm not saying ours is better, whatever, whatever. I just think, when you don't understand why this approach is valuable, then it's easy to, to like just opt out. Like there's people who were like, oh, well, the video is too long. It's like, well, yeah, we look, we've been doing, we know how to create short videos. Like we've only created short YouTube style videos before we started doing the podcast. Like we, we know how to do that shit and make that shit entertaining. Mm-hmm. Right. But for me personally, especially like, I just don't see as much value in it anymore uh, outside of us going like viral and just doing it for ourselves because there's plenty of videos who do that and I see how people really don't be learning like that a lot of times because they'll just watch a video they'll be entertained by it because we made the shit entertaining but then they're still falling by the wayside in terms of actually understanding how this shit all connects yeah, bro, people are interested man people are complaining about not having something and get it and then it's just like the song thing we heard earlier from the podcast I guess it's like I, mean, I want that dopamine release from the same Style, format, information I'm used to getting. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> See, there's a clip. I wasn't going to play this clip, but now I got to play that clip because it relates to this topic. Before I play, here's another thing. All right. This is just for all of y'all. This isn't us feeling away, right? We're not in our feelings, but it's just another example because we are content creators and we are creative and are all right. We just do it in a different way. When we, this backdrop that we have right now, there was somebody which ain't much of a backdrop. We in transition. But there's somebody <laughs> who was like, you ain't had to look like that in real life. This shit right here. Oh, man. <laughs> I can remember, man. It, it, it come back with the point. I saw somebody in the comments that was like, I missed the all black backdrop. Oh, yeah, I did see that. Yeah. This is the black room. And then I saw somebody else, a couple comments or videos later, that was like, oh my gosh, I love the new setup and the direction y'all are going. Right? Yeah. And then... When we were in transition, before we got to this step set up, we went from the black room to the to the middle room, and we just looked at it like, hey, like, bro, we just gonna throw this shit together because this ain't what we want at all. K Days, shout out to K Days. He was like, bro, I, I fuck with where y'all where y'all going with this. I like the new setup. And we like, bro, this this ain't it, dog. Come on, man. Like, he you knows like when you have all the the outfit you don't like, and people compliment your outfits, like, bro, come on. The outfit, but swag in hell, boy. Yeah, <laughs> you feel like the guy be making fun of you, but you know, knowing K Day, like he, he, it was, it was most likely genuine, man, genuine love, and we appreciate you. 
but it goes into that same insecurity or just be in process and building in real time and people can have different opinions about the same shit even you might be the negative opinion and someone's about your own shit while somebody else is positive about it or this guy said i missed the black room looking at our current setup and then somebody else said i love it now with this guy saying i missed the black room what did we get when we had the black room crickets not just crickets we had some people be able to say man this is kind of boring y'all shit oh, some shit on the wall i would love to see you two in the same clip so i can see you interacting with each other. Yeah, all that stuff right you ain't gonna please everybody ever it's just not gonna <laughs> it's just not gonna happen that is literally a part of the process and when you get used to it it's it's kind of fun to watch because it's it's almost mind-boggling sometimes like the way you can't win for losing you know it's kind of it's it's, it's kind of funny so i just like the comment that's what i said bro i'll be watching you and ej respond sometimes like y'all better than me like, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm just, i want you to like it so they know i saw it <laughs> and i'm moving past this one like damn they didn't acknowledge that like you're damn right i saw it and i ain't got nothing to say to you i don't acknowledge a lot of times but then <laughs> yes yeah, time there's plenty of times where i where i will if i feel like somebody just seeing something completely wrong i'm gonna let them know what you said because you know my, my pet peeve my pet peeve is when somebody argues something that i didn't say oh, in real life too not even just no comment shit it's like yeah, i didn't even say that and then they be arguing the shit that you said with the shit that you said. Yeah, bro. It's like you arguing against me and literally using what I just said as my argument. I saw this one comment, some guy left, and then you was like, man, he must have commented this before watching the clip because we touched him down. He's like, yeah, you're right. I did. I was like, bro, that's so Oh, wait, I didn't see I didn't see him respond back. You didn't see? That's, that be my thing, man. That's the shit that be can... <laughs> He's like, yeah, you're right. I had watched it yet. I was, I was like, bro, like, oh, my God. Bro, see? I didn't. I'm glad you told me that. That, that. that makes my soul rest a little easier. I did not realize that he actually responded because a lot of times I do honestly miss the response. I'll say stuff and then I forget to go back. <laughs> but that that's exactly a perfect example. I'm like, bruh, literally this entire section of your argument was word for word what the hell we just said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and you arguing like I don't know it. But whatever. And then I, I, I was okay. It's not about to be a whole like <laughs> section of us arguing about shit I were talking about and shit that people have said. But it's funny, man. With that being said, since it's so on topic, I'm gonna go ahead and play this clip. We didn't um, plan to play this one for this pod. But yeah, let, let, let's, let's go ahead and do it. Actually, I think it's over here. Yeah, let's let's play this because buddy, buddy preaching and speaking on up on this one. Let's see. I check this out. Bomani, if y'all don't know about Bomani, he has some dope clips and he's talking about basically how you can't win for losing as a content creator. But if you try to win too hard, you basically gonna lose anyway. That's a, that might have sounded confusing, but you know, when you listen to it, you'll see what I'm saying. I would try to win over haters by changing your content in the way that we describe. They're never gonna watch it. <laughs> right? You make all these changes for all these people and they've already made a decision about you and they're never going to watch the show. And all that work goes for naught, right? If there was three people sitting in this room, then all we're going to do is make a show for these three people. I went to a concert, I want to say it's like 12 years ago, somewhere in there. I went to go see Yellow Man at the Lincoln Theater in Raleigh. And Raleigh did not have a great track record for like promoting club shows and stuff like that. Like This is a legendary reggae artist, and it's like three people there. And so Yellow Man comes on stage, and he looks out, and he sees his three people, and he rocked it like it was Summer Jam. Right, the three people who were there were gonna get a full show because they paid the money to see that dude, right? And that really like inspired me and informed everything else that I wound up doing really in the end. Because no matter what, you gotta do the show, right? And so you do the show for the people who like it, to do it for the people who watch it, you do your stuff to make it as good as it possibly can be. And then everybody else gets to make their decision about it. But like, I ain't begging nobody to watch no television show. Let me tell you something. I get paid whether you watch it or not. I might not get paid to do it again, but for the right now, I get paid no matter what y'all do. So all I can hope for and what the game always has got to be, if this was going to be whatever it's going to be, it's going to be because the people who like it tell the people they know, and then they go from there. But I'm, I know better than to try to change. I feel like if you don't follow them, you mentioned them and you say you ain't looking at this page, you should follow him. Well, see, they're posting this clip on the HBO page, so it's not really all too much incentive there. The reason I said shit is that shit he said about 
like, hey, I get paid anyway. I might have paid to do it again. That was some shit you would say. <laughs> well, that felt like this is your Corey. Talk. So I agree with him. So I dropped the clip. I was like, you know, man, that's a that's a bar, man. They might not hire me again, but they hired me now. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. And like, there's, 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 there's people commenting. Um, I, like, love this, love this, and the quote. I feel like there was something that someone said that I wanted to bring up. Me and my sports husband love this show. Da da da. See, bro, I'll find it. But there's a, a couple of things. That I want to address here. One, uh, you brought in the artist example, which is beautiful, right? Perform like you got a thousand people, even if it's only one. Makes all the sense in the world, and it works. I mean, I remember even just starting YouTube, it was only one person. I was like a main consistent commenter. I'm like, as long as this dude giving energy, hey, I'm, I'm gonna keep posting. He disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Why to stop doing these things? <laughs> That was my only positive reinforcement. That was that wasn't somebody I actually knew. So, but like that energy works, and then you get stories like this, mm-hmm. right? Because he gave that. It was just a regular show, you know. He might have talked about it and say, "Oh yeah, I went to a yellow man." But like using this as an example, and even holding somebody high and putting him on a pedestal. Years later, he's bringing his story, and this this clip is going viral with yellow man's name on it. Now some people are like, "Who's yellow?" Man? I was like, "Who's yellow man?" Go check out Yellow Man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, like, that goes, like, both ways. And, oh, that was the comment that was in that same <laughs> vein, that Dave Chappelle quote from um that, that special. I don't know if you saw that one, but he was like, I'm like, I, you know, evil. Yeah. I get paid for the attempts. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> that's it. I tried, and that's what I get paid for. Yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but look, I, I love that perspective. Obviously, coming off of the conversation we just had, that's why I was just, you had to go ahead and play it right now. So, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Ooh. It just made sense. Just made sense. Very, very rarely do we play a clip to cap a conversation. <laughs> conversation. <laughs> to prove the point. The dot, the uh, like, you know what? Real quick, just in case you don't believe what I'm saying. Go about money. Here's a third party. <laughs> now, switching it up. Brent Fias, y'all haven't been watching Brent Fias for years. Then he's somebody to really go back, do a deep dive in the way this man is built up. Uh, you, you just got to do it because he's built indie. I mean, he's performing better than a lot of R and B artists. Mm-hmm. I think what is he around like ten or seventeen million streams? Some some crazy, like some something. He is up there, and we're talking about you know pretty legit and indie as indie can legitimately be. Yeah, All right, let, let's let's say that, right? So with that being said, in this clip right here, Brent Fiaz's manager reveals how he built his fan base with independent touring and ads. Last year, 22-year-old R&B singer Brent Fiaz caught a break. What were they offering? Well, I know the highest offer we got was kind of like a quarter million dollar advance, and it was like a $300,000 quarter budget for, for album one. I always said it was never about the money. It was always about the term. They began by incorporating Lost Kids, LLC, and investing $30,000 out of their own pockets to record Brent's debut album. They then went on a three-month tour using streaming data to guide the way. Yeah, no, definitely. We need to know about all analytics, all data. There has been several debating deaths filed a music to Pandora. Ty mines the data for those streams to find out exactly where and when a show will sell out. I'm looking at my Spotify and my SoundCloud analytics, like the top 50 market. I'm doing ads based on those top 50 markets. I will spend the money there because that's what the data already told me. All right, all right. Now, many of y'all might have seen this clip. I've definitely shared it on my page or reposted it before. It's been no, this is nothing new. This is a Vice News story. Um, EJ, we can put the link in the description for for folks who want to check out the pool thing when they watch the pod. But what I love about this clip is it's very simple with strategy, right? We do shows, mm-hmm. we do music, we do ads, right? Very easy, very replicable. Very easy, very replicable. And we've seen this and we've done this before with multiple artists and it works. It's an older school strategy. It's, it's crazy, like Facebook ads, it's like old school now, right? <laughs> or Instagram ads or just ads in general, but it does work. And the thing about this though, 
that I, I love the most is just strategy. And I, I mm-hmm. always bring this up. Like so many people are running ads thinking, how cheap can I get ads? Like my click through, how cheap can I get my conversion? If you're clever, nobody's attaching it to an actual strategy though. Right. And the part that takes it away from the strategy is just focusing on those direct numbers. These guys tie in um, Brent. Oh, these are my cities that are like top for my music. We can all see this. We're all aware of this. Like we're like, oh yeah, a lot of people in Atlanta like my music. A lot of people in, I don't know, LA seem, seem to like my music. But then people get afraid when they start running some ads and they see the ads are more expensive because you're fo- focused on a tighter market. You're not just doing world worldwide ads where everything's gonna be cheaper because you got more people to just, you know, in, in uh, to auction with. Cool, but it's more meaningful and worse having more expensive ads if it's tied to something legitimate at the end. If you're going to do a show there, yeah, it might suck that you're getting higher cost per conversion at that time, but if it's going to lead to you doing something real that you can't get done when you're doing worldwide ads because I got 100 fans in this city, five fans in that city, a thousand fans over here. Like it's so spread out, you lose out. And so now I don't know how to just, I can't go do a show in a market where it's only five fans. It's not going to be worth it. I can't even break even. And a lot of these times the goal is just to break even to make them stronger uh, fans, right? So you do this for years and you're touching like target the market, touch base with the fans, target the market, touch base with the fans, sell them some merch. All right, make it a little bit more real. I break even with the show. I make money with with the merch. Break even with the show. Make money with your merch, and and that starts to build. Next thing you know, I might even make money with the show, and then go crazy with the merch. Right? You repeat that enough, things build. You end up with a Brett Fias. Well, so when the music's good, right, and other factors at hand, but it's really not like you know rocket science, mm-hmm. but it is having strategy it doesn't have to be targeting a specific city and uh, planning to do a tour or anything there's other strategies but you have to attach it to something because all of these cost per clicks are meaningless when if you're just focused on how cheap can i get my ass and not how little money can i spend like that's that's always my gripe when it comes to ads and how people approach it there's no long term and people really in this space we get caught up or we conflate strategy and tactics and really people are very tactical very little strategy yeah and that, i mean that's even what i liked about his clip is you know i have a lot of artists who hit me asking exactly that like what is the ad strategy to start with and yeah you could argue that his strategy was you know a touring based ad strategy which anybody could do, but where you target is going to change that, that strategy for you exactly right. Exactly. Because we don't even know about the other nuances that went into that, right? I'm assuming that if I'm an artist that's and my data showing me that I should tour in, let's say like DC, Virginia, New York, that's gonna that that's gonna move my strategy differently than the artist that's saying that hey, I'm big in Houston, Dallas, Austin, or something like that, right? Because they know like culturally the places are different, so yeah. that opens up to different types of activations and partnerships and and, and things like that, right? So I think just even even just realizing that the data can be that to be a guide for you is really valuable because I think that so many artists try to fight against the data because they don't want to feel like the algorithm is controlling their career, right? Like, yeah, Spotify is telling me Atlanta's my, my popping city, but fuck Atlanta. I don't want to walk in Atlanta. I'm going to go build in LA because I want to do a show in LA, which, you know, like you said, there's a strategy behind it. Go for it. Do your thing. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, for you know most other cases, it's almost like, wow, you know what I'm saying? Like, you've already kind of done some of the free leg work to see that this is where your money should be spent. Why not go along with that? You know what I'm saying? Why not dig the hole that's already spitting up a little bit of oil? You know what I'm saying? Instead of digging off completely new. So that's what, I, that's what always got me about that clip was he was one of the first people I'd ever heard be so for the data in that way. You know what I'm saying? Um, especially at the time where a lot of artists at that time were, were bragging about not looking at analytics and stuff like that. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, but I agree with you, man. I think like it, this is also a show that ads can be a lot more useful than, than a lot of artists think they are. And I think because of what you're saying, there's that stigma behind ads where 
98% of people's objective is just to get the, the cheapest cost per click of conversions possible, right? Yep. And so when that's the bar for everybody, it, it it makes it to where it's easy for people to say this thing works or this thing doesn't work, right? Uh, but as a lot more nuance than that, you know what I'm saying? Like, like we've had campaigns before where the cost of the ad was expensive and from the artist perspective, it was a fail. But then once we start explaining certain things, it's like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. It's, it's work. I'm like, yeah, I mean, like you're paying for a, a more premium of a market. You know what I'm saying? You're paying, so you're paying this two dollars so this shit don't optimize in Brazil. We get you that that point oh oh one. That's what you want. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you know, if we're gonna build towards some type of like longer term play, then this is just the cost of like doing that. This is the cost of that strategy, right? And so people have to think about it. Like there is a cost with each marketing strategy that you implement, right? My ad strategy for an artist only wanting to build internationally is going to be cheaper than my ad strategy for the artist that wants to build domestically. You know what I'm saying? It's just the nature of the game. But I will be wrong to tell either of them that, that if they have strategy behind it, that either of them is right or wrong, right? Like this artist is like, hey, I, I got this grand vision of popping in Brazil first, and then I'm going to go over there and I'm going to do a, a Latin tour, and I'm going to take that money and come back in America and I'm going to invest, blah, blah, blah. Right, why, why, his or her strategy isn't any more wrong or right than the artist is like, hey, I'm gonna pop it on first and then build a, a buzz in my own city and I'm gonna sell merch doing local shows and I'm gonna take, right? It's the same, same end result, you know what I'm saying? Different path that you walk, that you kind of walk to get there. That right there is a level of focus, which implies strategy. Brazil first, that's still specific, even though yeah. Brazil has many cities and uh, states or provinces, whatever they call them, right? And then your hometown, like there's, that's something more specific, better, spec more specific, more likely you actually have a strategy. Yeah. Right. Or something closer to it, resembling. Um, because you got people who are like their strategy, quote unquote, is to run ads and try to make money from streams. Yeah. Crazy. Everybody that ever asked that. I just want you to know it's a, it's a hamster wheel of a mission that you run on. Unless. Unless you crack in the point oh 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 one places, you know what I'm saying? Even then, yeah, that they streams don't pay as much. <laughs> it's a hard thing to do to literally just run ads to your stream and make money. That should not be your plan. There are moments when you do make your money back because triggers an algorithm starts to move, so your your song starts to work beyond the money that you spent. Mm -hmm. But if that's your plan going into it, the expectation you want to put on the marketer or your manager or whoever then that's a faulty mission. That's a, that's a four or five year play. Well, well I always ask them, like, hey man, do you have the time <laughs> to do that strategy? That's yeah. a four or five year play right there. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's definitely uh, going to be a longer play in many cases. Now, <sighs> make me think about something. Well, I was going to say, you know who it, this whole conversation makes me think of, but we're literally watching this happen in real time. What right now, recently? Adrian campaign, bro. Like Adrian Milanio, uh, one of our clients who's having, you know, a lot of success right now in, in Thailand and the Philippines. And I remember 2020 when he was like, hey, I think I want to take the next couple of years and just focus on the Philippines and Thailand because I think that they'll take me because I, I make army music and I look the way I do. And at the time, man, you know, we, you know, all the, 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 the traditional, you know, uh, what's pink, what's red and, and green mixed together? What color is that? Are, part, red and green is purple? Oh, that's red and blue. Uh, red and green? Yellow? Maybe? I don't know. I don't know my colors, man. I don't roast me. But whatever that color flag is, you know, we were seeing those flags being way it was like, all right, man, your, your, your cost per click in Thailand is looking suspicious, but he's telling us, hey, but now I'm getting deals in, in, in their language and they, they're telling me things, right? And so, like, he stuck that strategy out for two years and then the song sparked on Spotify Viral 50 for those countries. And now that long term players worked out, it is, it is yellow? It's yellow. I, I'm good, bro. It's talking Look at that. Man, I knew, hey, man, art school, bro. It's paid off. Mary Color Wheel. The graphic design my bro, pay off, man. No, I'm a colors. But <laughs> but it's like that's the same shit, right? Like he it's like who are we in the moment to say like this is wrong or right? I was just glad he had a strategy. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like we am like, hey man, we could always look back on this a year or two from now and say, Hey, that was a good idea, that wasn't a good idea. Because the reality of it is, to your point about the tactics versus strategy, that's how I look at it. Tactics are something that could be completed within a couple of days to a couple of months. Strategies take years, you know what I'm saying? Like how do I know if my strategy to build my social prominence in Atlanta work if I don't at least have two years to go about to see how people talk about me? You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's, it's the same shit. So like to enact most of those strategies, like you need long term vision and the patience to kind of act it out. So I a lot of times, am, and even if I disagree with clients' marketing campaigns, sometimes 
like a lot of times it's them having a thought behind what, or having a why for why they want to do things enough to convince me. Because you know, then I started thinking like, well, maybe they thought about this deeper than I thought about it. You know, maybe they've seen something. Yeah. Uh, or at the very least, I know that they have a vision and idea and they're willing to trust it out long enough to, to, to make some assessments off of it. And like, you know, like you said, music is good and other things there. Typically it works out a long time, you know, and I'm really big on painting to at least the clients I get to talk to, but definitely any artist that talks to me where I'll tell them like, Hey, you know, there are going to be things that we do for you where you won't even really see the impact of it for like three or four months. You know what I'm saying? And so in the moment, it's going to feel like it's not working. But then three or four months later, you're going to look at them like, damn, no, that shit worked. Like, I can I can feel where this came from. And people are saying certain things to me and my shit just spiked out of nowhere. Right? Like, I literally had a client um, a couple weeks ago hit me. Her manager hit me. It was like, yeah, man, you know, in the moment, like, the artist wasn't really happy with y'all campaign. But she was just talking to me. I was like, man, they did a great job. Like, I'm looking at my analytics and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and I, I told her, I was like, three years. I was like, look at when it is. It's three, four months ago from when we did the campaign. You know what I'm saying? Three months have went by. I'm like, so. So I think that's a lot of times what deters the artists from like making strategies, like those kind of concrete strategies. Like you can't really gauge them in the short term. Like a, a strategy, a real strategy takes faith. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like exactly. you gotta like, Gary, believe. Man. Yeah, man. Like day by day, man, this shit dropping down or spiking weird, but you're like, nah, man, I, I feel it, man. I got one new follower from Atlanta. He's saying great things. This, this strategy to build me in Atlanta is, is moving. It's moving slow, but it's moving, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm big on it. if it's moving up, man, it's a good sign. As long as it's up trending, that's a right, good sign. Keep it, keep it pushing. So, yeah. but that was what I liked about the, the tie club, man. It's just like one, just I think more artists need to be understand, need to understand that the data can be a tool for you. You know what I'm saying? Um, and sometimes if you don't feel like you have enough information to make these strategic decisions that Sean and I are talking about, like that's why these different tools exist to give you as much information as possible to to help you make the best, most calculated decision that you possibly can. Um, and the second thing is like, yeah, bro, the ad strategy is deep. You know what I'm saying? Like he talked about one, he essentially is doing like the tour building strategy, but it's like, it can get deep, bro. Well, I know we got at least like seven, eight yeah. different ones. We can just whip out the bucket. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Shit need to go a certain way. And so it's like, if you're reading this or not reading this, listen to this and you've had your skepticism with advertisement and you feel like advertisement don't work for you. You know what I'm saying? Very rarely is the canvas the reason that the painting is trash. You know what I'm saying? Very, very rarely is the is the paintbrush the reason that paint is trash. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one there. Let, let that one soak. But I will say <laughs> the other benefit of like focus mm -hmm. that people have to have faith to get to that moment in time when you're focused on a specific city. I've said this plenty of times. All right, you can have a moment like. Corey, you pull up today, you play a song, and I'm like, oh, shoot, bro. You know that song? Bro, that's my song. I just discovered that song from some ad the other day or some influencer in this market. Then you have somebody else. Oh, snap, you know that song? Like, that organic spread is something that's not going to happen Our marketing in all these random different places, mm -hmm. right? So if I spend more money marketing here again it's more expensive in the short term but once i hit a certain threshold you start to have an organic effect mm -hmm. where all these people in that same market actually know who you are have had some type of experience so then they start to spread it and share it and now they have that powerful experience of experiencing it with other people and we know that's the lock we talk about how nostalgia really builds moments up and makes music more important to us than it actually was and even the main the, the time well, if more of us know this song, we can create these experiences together. If we have experiences together, especially if they're positive, we're going to want to replay this song, right? So this is how you start to build that and become a part of people's lives as an artist, by like being focused in a specific place and being able to take over that location and then find another location. And then next thing you know, you got the whole state, you got the whole country, and maybe, you know, if you're that type of artist and that's your goal, you might have the whole world. So... It's something to consider, but staying in the, the touring space, LaRussell dropped his stats and he didn't really made that much money from his show. He made like a hundred dollars from a show that he threw. However, what he shared is really a positive that I should take, uh, that everybody should take from it because he showed the entire PL from a show that he did. I don't know where it was, I think it was in Seattle. And you're talking about how much he paid in terms of the merch people, 
how much he paid. Let me enlarge this. And it's really something we can link to this post in the comments too, because I, I think people need to really see it to really feel it uh, more than anything. But let's, yeah, let's enlarge this on the screen and everything. All right, so for example, the venues. Yeah, he did on February 26, 2003, a, a, a uh, show in Seattle. And then also on the 25th of February, 2023, he did a show in Portland. 453 tickets sold in Seattle and 479 sold in Portland. The total revenue was $8,176.50 from his Seattle show and $8,652.90 from his Portland show. So first of all, that's an inspiration. He made 16 grand, nearly 17 grand from doing two shows as an indie artist building up, right? Great. Average tickets price was $18 for both of these shows. It's interesting that they're like one cent difference in their average tickets price. But from there, he breaks down the flights that were involved. I don't know if that was just him or uh, I guess. Okay. Yeah, actually he does. He has his, the flight for the crew. Looks like he has two people on the crew, maybe. And so he paid for their, uh, two people's flight. He paid for two people's um, flights who were on merch staff. So that's different than his crew. And then two performers. That's him. And maybe that was a a singer or something or a backup. Or maybe it was a, a opening act. I don't know. Now, what's interesting. <laughs> If I'm, if I'm tripping, one of these tickets costs a lot more than the other. Oh, there, right? yeah. Now, uh, tell me this, LaRussell. Is that your ticket, bro? Did you did you got to do first class or something? Well, no, I was there because that, that? that was from San Francisco to Portland. The second one's from Seattle to San Francisco. I see. I see. I see. Yes. So that actually might be him. Maybe it's Seattle to San Fran to San Fran. Well, no. I don't know. Either way it go. Now, I, I'm just playing. Like, like hey, buddy, I got to be first class. But no, <laughs> please, maybe it might just be the city and the time. But, and also, who knows how fast he had to like book the ticket so he might not have had a chance to get the best prices you know, right yeah but the lodging he breaks down all of this so lesson here man above all the whether i made money whether i uh didn't make money and all of that value there plenty valuable but the fact that it's on paper or an excel document if you want to be 2023 about it like it's actually tracked he has his numbers this is something that everybody can be doing at every single level, mm -hmm. like period. And I don't see enough people doing it. I remember being on a call where some people who wanted to be a part of our music marketer program. It might've been January when I first spoke to him and we, we had a conversation whether, you know, um, like I would accept them to the program or not. And I determined that, you know, they were a solid fit and would be excited to work with them. But, but one thing they ended up saying throughout the conversation was they spent 10 racks in 2022 those 10 racks that they spent in 2022 for the music was not planned at the beginning of the year there was no budget to spend 10 racks you know what they did they spent 25 dollars here oh snap here's an outlook spent 100 here oh snap we got a music video and oh no it'll be cool if we go to miami real quick and shoot a video and these tickets are cheap so let's go spend another 500 dollars here and then marketing Ooh. I just saw some random ad and they said that was cheap. And then I just saw a new YouTube video and, and then that was another $400 because that strategy was sounded like it was good. Right. And they nickel and dived and spent 10 K. Mm -hmm. But if you ever asked them, was it possible to spend 10 K at the beginning of the year? They wouldn't even think that they would have came, come across that much money. Spent the money without a plan, spent the money without the right decision-making process. If they had that mentality at the beginning of the year and said, hey, we're going to, like, I get it. They might not know. Sometimes you're in that mindset that they, not, it's, like, it's even hard to imagine that you can spend $10,000. So planning to spend $10,000 might sound absurd to you, mm -hmm. right? But just imagine. And that was part of what I said. Look, if y'all, when y'all get in, the we, we can help you, right? Because the money you spent to even get in or be a part of this, the rest of that money is going to be spent with the proper decision making. So you're going to see progress because y'all just spent $10,000 by mistake and didn't get any progress. All right. Or did not get as much progress as you would have had if you spent a quarter of that or an eighth of that on maybe getting the right mentorship or 
or team members or whatever that might look like to get you from the right position to make to spend the rest of the money the best way possible. And that goes back to did you track your numbers? Like tracking it along the way. He knows what he spent. This he posted this when five days days ago. So that makes that I don't know, like early March, right? And this show happened on the 26th. So six days later, about he was able to post the numbers from his shows. I'm sure he had it. He might have just taken a while to even think that, oh, this would be a cool post to do. He has those numbers. This isn't at the end of the year. And oh snap, I just spent this this much money. And now he can be aware. And now he also has a threshold to say, oh yeah, okay, this is what it looks like when I spend this much money. And this is where the costs go. And now I want to do another show. These are what my costs are probably going to look like that or somewhere similar. Ooh, now what if I can figure out a way to plan a little further ahead and maybe I can shave like $400 off of my tickets. And now I would have profited $600 instead of $100 on this show, mm -hmm. right? Or it's just a better market or a cheaper market for me to fly to. So all these numbers drop. All right. Well, next time the team eating sandwiches. Right. Exactly. Next time they eat sandwiches. You know, hey, we all sleep in a car or whatever it is. Right. But you have something to work off of and now make your future decisions off of. That's what I like about this more than anything else. I know it's inspirational for people to see like that somebody else isn't winning as big as they might look like they're winning or or that there's down periods. I get all that. But the biggest takeaway should not be that shit. The biggest takeaway should be he is tracking his shit because that's the part that's going to change what you do. The inspiration is nice and make you feel better. I get that. But like if you operate like this, that will legitimately, literally change your entire process. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, I think people need to take this to understand, bro. Like breaking even in, in the world of throwing shows is a, is a plus. I'm saying like most events don't break either. Bro. Like yeah. most events, you be you're lucky to not have a massive loss. Yeah. Like oh, you only lost five k. Yeah, bro, good job. You know what I'm saying? So it's like oh, you made you profited a hundred. Damn, bro, good job. Because it's like you know, like I said, he made back sixteen k, but you got to spend sixteen plus. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so you know, kind of going back to that strategy conversation about just having the faith in the strategy that this is going to help because you know the disconnect I will see with shows a lot of the time is that I think that successful and progressive artists see shows as marketing opportunities for probably the first few years of their careers and then big cap latter years of their careers. Most artists are thinking backwards. They think this shit is a cap out the gate. If I can just start doing shows, I'll start making money. It's like maybe if you're doing like club appearances or something, but then you're going to be building in situations where you don't get to control much of the experience. You don't really get the data. I'm saying so yeah maybe you made some money but then everything else is valuable about that you lost out on because of this right but for the situations where it's going to be lucrative to you maybe more long term than short term with i.e like situations like this where you putting together your own show your own tour things like that one like you said the experience of doing this is valuable because this can be applied across the board if you're an artist and you want to track you know what I'm saying your streaming revenue bro make a little sheet just like this how much did you spend on the cover art how much did you spend on distribution Right, how'd you, how much did you spend on marketing for it and then how much money does shit make you back a quarter? Like you could you could track the exact same shit across any portion of your industry or your your career, right? You're doing merch, you do the same thing. How much did it take me to make these t-shirts and how many did I sell? And shit like that, right? So it's like the skill set alone is is invaluable. Um, then too, if you're looking at, if he's looking at this like a marketing opportunity, like I feel like he is, then, you know, one, this is just the, the call. Now that loss just becomes the cost of marketing. You know what I'm saying? And there's always a cost of marketing. There's always some money you spend in marketing if you probably ain't getting back. You just gotta be okay with that. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it changes thinking of it as marketing makes you more okay with it and thinking of it as like, oh, this is a show I'm supposed to get paid off of. Now you, your brain is your brain's wired different there, right? But um so it's like not only is he you know, he he's setting the foundation where this show that he broke even on today might produce a show for him two years from now that makes it to where he makes a hundred cat and like you know what I'm saying? Uh, create real fans that yeah. show connection is still different we just talked about yeah. and it was this podcast or last wow. we were talking about like the remote work versus going in the office oh yeah 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 it's the same thing yeah. Re remote work man we you just hear me on my on stream and you just watch me on instagram but going into the office yeah. like performing in person shaking my hand dapping me up on stage man you know you pay 20 also you know so and it's like the smart artists see shows that way like i, I have a lot of artists homies and 
you know, industry friends who like, like I, I know artists whose team paid to get him on Rolling Loud just because of the press look. They were like, hey, like, we not going to make any money from Rolling Loud, but we can take this and he got a release coming this Friday and we can say, hey, this artist was just on Rolling Loud and one of the slots. You know what I'm saying? So like sometimes you're going to pay for and do things in music where the cap, the big cap that you're looking for isn't going to come until later down the line. You know what I'm saying? And I think that the difference between, you know, the the smart artists and the non-smart artists is the ability to see like when it makes sense to do something like that. And when is it, hey, I'm not going to make a, I'm, I'm going I'm to lose 10K, but if the, 10, if the event hit like I need to, then that's going to be a 10K, that's going to be 10K worth spent, you know what I'm saying? And what's 10K if that shit bring you back 100K over the next year or two, you know what I'm saying? See, but you know what that takes. Sense and patience. And strategy. And strategy, yeah. And strategy. <laughs> now, flipping this on his head, well, actually, I got I want to read uh, La Russell's Oh, okay. yeah, you know, just to do it, do it justice. Moment of transparency. I don't always win, but I always take the risk. You know, down. So that's a that's an entrepreneur's <laughs> there. Oh, okay, okay. God, I'm, I'm not saying that's a quote he took from. My oh, God, God, like you know, he did put it in quote, so he probably did get it. Or I'm just saying, like that's some shit of entrepreneur. Yeah, okay, so, I got you, I got you. Know you. This weekend I did two shows. One sold out. The other did nearly 500 tickets. I still lost money all caps. This is typical for me because I allow people to pay whatever they want. I'm super grateful for those who really value my presence. Pay extra and really take care of a nigga. I put on an experience that could easily charge. I could easily charge hundreds for, but I refuse to. This is the reality of how this shit goes. Pray your hands. It ain't always pretty but it's always beautiful. Shout out to the squad, ENT Legends, for taking the risk with me, even when the profit ain't there. Impact cannot be quantified. Hey, now let's talk about these folks who took a risk with them, ENT. So they made $55 a good company, which is um, the Russell's company. Yeah. They made $55, or maybe that's $53.20. That's what both of them made, so it looked like they did a 50-50 profit share on this risk they took together, right? But, ENT, they get a good look from this too. Mm -hmm. Because one, they took a risk that sounds like they're good, they're artist friendly. Russell's actually posting about this in good faith and, and, and shining light on his partners. So they're taking a risk, right? It's This is, talk about the, mar the manager, the professional side, and how you have to think. Yeah. This is why it's not just about an artist specific perspective, it's understanding the people who are involved, how they see the game that you're going to be working with, and understanding just from a a business person, business owner's perspective, where the value is for you personally and others involved. So no, ENT the L what is it? ENT Legends. That's what it's called. Like they didn't get probably the biggest win in the world, but if they're smart, they're gonna know how to continue to bring value with this. Because Russell's somebody who's been moving well and bringing good attention for himself, so they're gonna be able to like just from association, hopefully. Be able to say, hey, we had a great experience with Lil Russell and that dope experience that he put on for his fans. We were a part of it, right? Now let's flip it into something that Lil Russell does very well. We've talked about this, not from Lil Russell's standpoint, but for other people. When I always talk about taking your losses and flipping it to a W, mm -hmm. Lil Russell does this very well because he shares so much and it's just bound to happen with something. But especially with your losses, the way people are in this game, losses go viral. People love to hear, even if the loss, is, it loss isn't coming from a positive space and you didn't share this, people would spread it and it would have went viral. The Russell yeah. ain't really making money like he he, he say he is, right? But he took uh, control and, and power. Uh, not that he was afraid of it, but like even him posting it, it just comes from a different space. Mm -hmm. He's going viral for sharing this. That's more marketing for La Russell. That makes him seem and appear bigger than he is. That's all marketing is in a lot of ways, right? Because mm -hmm. you keep getting talked about, you keep getting talked about, and that appearance eventually becomes reality because people start to say there must be power in this thing because that's why it's being spoken about and brought up so much, right? Omnipresence. And what Russell does very good at is especially capitalizing off of the narrative, especially within the industry. Mm -hmm. With the industry folks, we, you know, we, we love talking about this stuff, right? We love sharing this stuff, right? And, you know, because it speaks, but sometimes it's just our validation to speak against, well, uh, speak about when we're talking to artist clients. Like, hey, look at Russell, man. I, I told you this for X, Y, and Z, right? 
But sharing this again flips not only the show profit, right? That wasn't all that much into a good story that connects him stronger with his fans because his fans are like, oh man, we appreciate your humility. And now we connect you with you more. And if we can pay more money, we're going to pay more money because we love the humility and the thankfulness that you still express even though you didn't make money. And we see and understand the risk that you're taking. People are paying the money that they're paying for a lot of the Russell shit because they understand what this nigga's going through. A lot of y'all stories, because you're trying to appear so fucking cool, people think you cool. Yeah. They're like, closed mouth don't get a fan, bro. I thought you had everything handled. You like, man, nobody can help me. It's like, bro, as far as I knew, you were cool. Like, I didn't know you were going through it. Not that he's positioned it as like, what was me? He's just sharing the journey, and people see that it's more effort than it looks like. Mm-hmm. It's not all, you know, uh, rainbows and butterflies. So now they understand the impact of the effort that they're putting in. And it's easier to impact here and feel a positive dopamine rush of investing and helping this guy do this than it is for me to like go vote on like the president or something. I don't know if my vote was the the one that tipped the scale or not, right? <laughs> I know this twenty dollars got him home that night. This, I know this twenty dollars helped this man get home. I mean, I know <laughs> what to like let me see. Twenty dollars a ticket, five, fifty three, you know, like we're talking about literally tipping the scale. Fifty three dollars in the Profit, I was I could have been one of the five people that, that made this thing go in the green. Yeah. Right? So there's so many benefits of sharing your story because there's so many stakeholders. You got the fans that are gonna connect more. You got the fans that are gonna understand and now want to invest more. You got the other people that are just gonna share it for better or worse, whether they trying to say, Oh, this person ain't making no money like that, or they're trying to say, Hey man, this is an inspiring story and I wanna share it. You got the other people who are being petty and like, hey bro, I told you. See, I'm sharing this just because I want to prove it to my other folks that I was right or this is how you, just a part of the game. So now you're and now you're getting additional marketing going viral for free. All right. Off of a quote unquote loss, mm-hmm. which isn't a loss like you already alluded to. It's very hard to make show money. It's like coming from ground zero, especially like just fuck, fuck up. Uh, even just coming from ground zero, it's hard for big artists. Oh yeah, we already went through it with uh, what was the name? Um, Lord, Lord, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah Lord situation. Yeah, like it's it's actually hard. Period. Let's actually get that completely right. It's not even. We're talking about Jay Z had to change the ticket prices a few years ago and say what well, I forgot what excuse they used, but we've seen it with Jay Z and Nicki Minaj for a period. And you know, that don't mean they aren't as big as they are, and they aren't like legit it's just it really is hard mm-hmm. the math to figure out the shows and the logistics and do it with, the, with real production man I wish I got to see some video from this performance it's La Russell he pretty much records like every day so hopefully you know he uh, posted or whatever he probably will but he said he put on experience that he would have could have charged hundreds for it yeah. I want to see that shit. Not because, not from a hated perspective, but I want to see it like, if it really, do I really see, can I, does it really seem like it was something that could have charged hundreds for? Because you have people that will say that shit like in their ego, like, man, this shit was amazing. Or not even just being able to see like the value that it was for other people. Because I know I put so much in this shit. I feel like I could have been able to do, but maybe it wasn't all that like extra dope. Right? So there's that thing. And then the other thing is, well, maybe he actually did put on a crazy experience, but that doesn't mean he captured it in a way that you could tell. And that was some shit that you know, I always tell people I learned that shit from doing the festival. First time, didn't really have no one for the cameras. Amazing event. Nobody shit happened. You know what I mean? Except for all the people that went. Luckily, it was a whole lot of people they wanted me to do it again. Blah, blah, blah. But like, when I was trying, when it really hit was when I was trying to market it. The second time around, I was like, damn, I don't got no footage of this shit. Yeah, no <laughs> proof. What the fuck? And then the second time, <laughs> I was like, all right, let all these niggas with cameras in and all these people with videos. And then what happened? I had cameras, I had videos, but that shit didn't really do the experience justice. All right. Some people just weren't good photographers. Some people were. And 
They were, but it wasn't enough. Or they were, they didn't capture the full story. They were, and it captured a different POV than what I was trying to express creatively through the marketing and, and, and the event itself, right? Then a third time, all right, yeah, we're gonna let all these people in free to capture all these random in images so we can get some extra stuff, but I'm gonna hire some dudes specifically to tell the exact story that I wanted to tell and say, at this time, these doors are opening. They were gonna surprise people with these doors. In this room, this is going in, that's going in. I want you to be at this door when we open it so you can see people coming through. And now we got a, a legitimate experience that people can tell that there's multiple tiers and it's a lot of shit going on, right? So I wanna know from that perspective because it would suck if he has an, an experience that legitimately was something extra and dope, but it didn't get captured in that way. And I think, you know, it's, it's hard to know that shit up front, right? Because you know you did it, but it takes a few times where you're like, Dang, that's, not, that's not hitting like, like this shit just looks like a regular party or a regular concert. I promise you this shit was not regular, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I promise you. So next time, why you, you you change it? So I would love to see what it looks like when he, when he come, comes out with it. Though. Yeah, and just to learn, like you said, he could have been undercharging. Yes, exactly. Well, no, he already said that. Well, you know, he yeah, you're right. But well, he could have been severely undercharged, right? right but right. and he, even on that, real quick, I feel like he already said the parameters for the next batch of fans. He already said I could be paying hundreds mm -hmm. for this. So now I know as long if I'm a, as a fan, marketing message. Exactly, that's what I'm saying, bro. So now I know as a fan, like if I pay anything between here and here, I'm within, you know. I either got a good deal or I paid about what it was worth. Yeah, right. he, he he gave him the this is valued at five thousand dollars. Yeah. I'm gonna get T for one fifty. Hey. But if you want to pay five thousand, I ain't gonna stop you. That's why I, I look at him as a marketer first, but I look at a lot of these <laughs> first the ones that are, that are that are so good at this, but <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, I'll pay that meal. I was like, I gotta tell me how much I could pay for this. Hey. You could pay a couple hundred, bro. How much you could? Hey. For real. And now you see that value. Yep. That's for real. Now, with that being said, let's final topic, very much related to these last topics. It's been teams and touring today. That's what we've been talking about. Three reasons why musicians should throw their own shows. More control of the feel and intimacy of the show. Facts. I am a huge advocate of this. I say this shit all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Whenever I did my, my events, I never did them in like a show specific venue because right. mm -hmm. it already has a tone that's set and it's hard to create an experience outside of the experience that most people are going to get when they go there here's the stage here's the bar and this is where everybody can stand and you can't really change much about that they don't really let you in, in many cases and also the tone is already set right but if you have a different well if you have your own venue and it's a typical show venue, at least you have more control of doing the show when you're on somebody else's show, right? Whether it's a promoter or an artist, at least you have that. But the next level, which we talked about a few, uh, a few weeks ago, is having a spot that's not even necessarily a typical live event spot. They might have, you know, all the outlets and shit, like when we did a venture ATL in the school, or they might have, uh, I think you, you said y'all did a bookstore or y'all were going to do some shit in a bookstore. Yeah, our very first show we did back in the tattoo shop. Back tattoo shop, right? So you ha you can create all different types of vibes. It's so, so valuable. I cannot stress enough how valuable it is to do shit in non-show venues. And you make more money that way. You don't got to deal with all them other uh, overheads and things. La Russell, we just talked about La Russell, the backyard. Yeah, that shit would not be as as special if it wasn't in the backyard. If that was just at some regular venue, that might have been he could have been getting the venue for free because he got some, some homies or whatever. So it's not even about the price. The same thing, even if he didn't have to pay for it, wouldn't have the same level of benefit for him on the back end if he just did it in a regular venue instead of doing that shit in his backyard. That's a part of the fucking story. Yeah. So you gotta tell the story and you create the story by doing stuff in different spaces. Now. The second thing that they know is more earnings, which, hey, well, yeah, you control more of it. You make more money. You have to pay um, less people. You don't have to pay the event space owner or whatever. So we get that. I think the last thing is just as important as that first thing. Those are the ones I focus on the most. More control and feel and intimacy of the show. And number three is you get a new perspective on show production. 
Facts. So much respect for it. Uh, you don't respect putting the show together until you put a show together. Hey, man. <laughs> it's different. It's different. Like, you, you understand all the nuts and bolts, so you got all kind of respect for the for the team, the the anything that goes wrong, you understand it more, but also it allows you to think from a different level of creativity too. Because mm-hmm. when you understand those elements, you can think, of, oh, when this happens, I'm going to do that. Or to typically, this is done this way, but now that I understand holistically, I actually realize I don't have to do it that way. Yeah. All right. Cause this isn't going to domino effect and, and, and shut everything else down. Sometimes we don't change stuff because we think it has to be done that way or else none of the rest of this shit works. But once you understand it, it's like, Oh no, yeah, I can move this and then insert something else. So that new perspective helps there. I mean, obviously when you scale up as an artist, just understanding how, how your team works, the nuts and bolts of everything, the new perspective is, is huge. Uh, on this one, you got anything else that you want to add in terms of like throwing your own shows in terms of value that makes it cool, that makes it more valuable? I mean, I would say, was it controlling this many bars, getting new show production? I mean, kind of like I was saying earlier, you get a lot more um, control over the data, right? Like you get the emails, you get the phone numbers, yes. you control the way you, you can interact with fans in the venue, which I mean, most venues are typically pretty cool with letting you set certain things up, but you know, if you want that complete control, you know, your show. Um, but that one is huge to me because, like I said, that could be the difference between like a, a hundred person show financially isn't crazy, but a hundred emails is very valuable. Right? Um, so I think like just being able to get access to that says a lot. And then I would say, a, a, I mean, I guess it's, it does fall within the you know curation of the experience. But putting y'all on the show together also makes sure that you get the most favorable light in the event. You know, because every artist is going to get booked for an event where they put you in a trash slot. Yeah. Comes with the territory, bro. So it's a growing pains. You know what I'm saying? You're going to be first. You're going to be last. Which everybody thinks going last is cool. Going last is only cool if you're the headliner. If you're not a headliner material, going last is, is a death wish. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Everybody going home doing your set. <laughs> everybody knows, oh, I got no time to get the parking lot before you finish your set. <laughs> Great. This is what I'm getting out. So, you know, but you get more control over when and how. Like, I mean, I know artists, um, when I first ever started working for that label I worked for, I remember there was this artist that we signed and in his college days, he would, he went to college like somewhere in Boston and he would just like book acts to come through Boston and like make himself the opener. You know what I'm saying? Um, but so he was also making money off of throwing these shows around the Boston area and using them as a way to like plug himself and plug his own music, which I always thought was genius. Cause it's like, Hey bro, double dipping. You know what I'm saying? You make some money and you gonna make sure, Hey, I'm going on right before this person come on. I'm not putting random little who the fuck, whatever. You can go first. You know what I'm saying? You can go last or whatever. So um I think it's undervalued about controlling your position on the show because like like you to your point, once you understand your audience and the people that's attracted to the event, you know exactly where you want to put yourself. Like whenever we used to do Blue Summers, if there was an artist on the Blue Summer docket that we really, really fuck with, we put them like third or fourth. Because we know it's a great spot. You had enough time for all the early people to come in and get settled and then they're a little lit and they're having fun, right? And you're not like too far out where like people are gonna leave doing your set. They know it's still more to come, so they're gonna stick around for a little more versus like the first three and the last three, they got different issues. You no, know, the different sides of the same coin with basically the same issues, right? Um, but yeah, position on the show is super, super valuable. But other than that, man, I think they, they touch on touch on all the big stuff on like why you should be throwing the show. I guess the last thing I would say would be the the reason you should throw your own show is because nobody else is booking you. <laughs> you know, as, as fucked up as that sounds, that's the a large reason. That's the reason I know why many artists are throwing their own shows. It's the only reason I started throwing shows. Like I, I had an artist that I was managing. Nobody would book the motherfuckers. So I started throwing my own events. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm gonna put you on that shit, right? And like I said, I've met. There's an artist in the city named Jelani. Jelani's like that. Jelani told me that's how he got started doing his own show. Where he wanted pretty much all the things that this said, like when it comes with the control. But then he was like, "Yeah, man, I just know it's like." I want to do shows like once a month and nobody was booking me once a month. So I started throwing my own shit once a month, you know, however frequently he was doing it. So that could also be a reason you put a show together is that nobody else will book you for better or for worse. You know what I'm saying? For whatever reason is the reason people won't book you. I ain't here to talk about that. I'm just saying if it ain't happening, you can do it. Cause it's not as complicated as people think it is to throw a show. It is, it is complicated. Don't get me wrong, yeah, it's but it's not as hard as people would think it is. Right. It's like a very simple show. You just need a venue, a DJ, um, you know what I'm saying? Some performers, 
and it's people to help you promote it. But uh, like that's a like it's, it's a little deeper in that. But like very surface level, that's all you need is all a decently successful show. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and then you can build in production value and and, and entertainment value as things go on. But like like that formula alone, I've seen artists be able to put themselves in front of their first twenty people, thirty people, fifty people crowd. You right. know what I'm saying? And then go from there. So yeah, nobody's booking you, bro. It's not some maybe you gotta prove to people why you should be booked first. Put your money up, throw a fire show, get some footage of it, like you said, and then that becomes your highlight reel. And then people will book you. You know what I'm saying? Like my artist one, we did the Blue Summers. Well no, because we haven't put on Blue Summer, but you know, the early shows like that that did help. I remember sending emails with footage from the first couple shows and like, yo, look at him. You know what I'm saying? He's a star. Don't you wanna book this guy? Don't you wanna throw us a bag to come out of wherever you at? <laughs> See, this is something that we did very well i actually didn't have anything to say until you said that last thing the highlight reel for your artist mm. rich that right there is another thing you should add to this list right just all out you get highlights that you, <clears throat> excuse me you get highlights that you can you know flex about on social media and no. you know, help use to get yourself booked for other shows when you convince and you're like on the line because there are some people who will book you if you seem like you can bring a good performance, mm -hmm. all right? Yep, they don't care about crowd. They don't necessarily care, care about you having a whole bunch of uh, like followers or, or streams and any of that stuff, right? But in these goals, especially for people who are throwing shows, your show will go to another level if you look at everybody as your customer. Artists, this works as well, right? Because you need to look at your fans, where's your customer, then your, then your fans. Not just, oh, how cool I look, but how can I make sure they have the best experience ever? But what we did was make sure the artists had the best experience ever, too. Like, we gave them looks and feels like they were not getting looks and feels. Like, I don't know if you remember, like, some of the, like, shots. And, like, one for Floyd. Like, bro, we got a crazy, like, photo of Floyd. I remember, I, I still think of to this day, this nigga look lit. Like, he was, like, <laughs> the biggest artist in the world, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you do that kind of shit, like, people are going to want to be a part of it, and you don't have to do as much to, like, find artists and, and convincing people, because they're like, dang. Like, one, it, even if this wasn't big, just to have this shit for me to market later would be great, but they also are going to start to feel like, well, this is something official. Like, you'll start getting better curated selection and everything. So, yeah, if you could think about everybody like a customer, that's the simplest way of saying it and serve them that way but especially with the artists yeah like make them look as dope as possible because that's also gonna make them feel dope and it's gonna make it it, it it goes full circle so um yeah that highlight reel is essentially what i thought about when it was like yeah help the heart help the artists make a highlight reel for themselves if you're more of a promoter and somebody who's trying to build from the ground up not like the typical club shit because you know they, they got different they got different things. Different group people. They don't, they, yeah, they don't have to think much. They got know. different struggles. <laughs> They're different, definitely different struggle. <laughs> it's definitely different stretches. You got anything you want to end with? Nah, man, I think that was everything. All right, bet, bet, bet. Well, as always, this is another, yet another episode every Tuesday and Thursday of No Labels Necessary, episode number 40. Today, I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. We out. Peace.